So let me start to share my screen. Are you able to uh, see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So let's begin. So this is where we had uh, stopped the last time. We said that if you look at a typical radio galaxy, uh, then it seems to show four kinds of features. One is emission from the core. The core corresponds uh, to the position of the optical galaxy where the AGN is sitting. And uh, then there is often a jet. Sometimes uh, there are two-sided jets. Sometimes there are one-sided jets. Uh, and then there are lobes, usually two-sided, but as we shall see, occasionally one-sided as well. Uh, and then within the lobes, you can see uh, within each lobe, uh, uh, one or more hotspots uh, in some cases. Uh, remember that all there, any of these features can be missing. Okay? So usually you don't have a hotspot without a lobe. Uh, but you can have a lobe without a hotspot, but any of the other features can be completely missing. You can have lobes without a jet, uh, you can have uh, lobes without a jet and a pore and so on. So, but these are just the broad features uh, which exist in uh, many radio galaxies and therefore it is useful to think of a radio galaxy as a superposition of these uh, four components. Okay, so what, does, what are the properties of the core in the radio? Uh, the core is usually compact. Uh, what does one mean by compact? Which means it is unresolved at the uh, typical uh, resolution of uh, high resolution radio interferometers, uh, like the GMRT or the VLA. Uh, so which means that the core is typically smaller than 0.1 uh, arc seconds in size. So we therefore we call it a uh, a compact source uh, at the typical distances of uh, radio galaxy that corresponds to say about a kiloparsec uh, or a little bit less than that in physical size. Cores are often uh, flat spectrum, uh, which indicates that there is synchrotron self absorption going on. So uh, 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 there is, uh, uh, it uh, may not be dominating yet but it is at radio frequency, you can, you can easily have a situation where the synchrotron self absorption uh, is becoming comparable to the synchrotron emission itself. And then that uh, leads to attenuation of the, uh, of the synchrotron uh, flux that you see. So cores often show this property with very large baseline interferometry where the baselines are tens of thousands of kilometers long like we saw in the case of the event horizon telescope uh, in such a situation you are able to uh, uh, resolve uh, the core uh, what you saw is the core in the interferometer gets resolved out in vlbi and there you usually again see a compact flat core which corresponds to the mm, so the region around the accretion disk uh, of the radio galaxy and <clears throat> jet-like structures. So there is evidence now that just like you see uh, jets uh, on, the, on the length scales of kiloparsecs in radio galaxies, you do also see jets on parsec scales uh, with very long baseline interferometric observations. Uh, cores are most easily detected at high frequencies for two reasons. One reason we've already seen, they have a flat spectrum. Therefore, relative uh, to the other components, the core will become brighter uh, at, uh, at high uh, frequencies. So the radio lobes, which, we have, which, which have a steep spectrum, would disappear at high frequencies, say at 5 gigahertz or higher frequencies. But the core will still be uh, emitting strongly because it's a flat spectrum source. And uh, so this is one reason. What is the other reason? Why are cores easier to detect at higher frequencies?
they're easier to detect because the what tends to happen this is really a limitation of the radio techniques that as you go to higher and higher resolutions which can be done either by increasing your baselines or by increasing your frequency uh, the uh, extended features tend to get resolved out they are no longer detected because they are relatively low surface brightness but our ability to detect a point source so long as it is unresolved even at those high radio frequencies remains unchanged and because of that it becomes easier to detect a compact uh, unresolved object at higher frequencies in addition to the fact that it is sort of relatively brighter compared to the other components now cores can uh, be composed of less than 1% of the total radio emission of the galaxy, uh, or they can be as much as 100%. So, which means you see only a core. Uh, there are some uh, several high redshift quasars known where you can see radio emission from the core, uh, but you cannot see any other, you could don't see any jets or lobes or anything like that. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a combination of many factors. Uh, including the fact that there could be evolution in the in the in the number density or the uh, probability of finding lobes as a function of redshift. Okay, so so the, then there are the lobes. Uh, the lobes uh, are steep spectrum, uh, as we shall see in a few minutes. Uh, these lobes can extend to very very large sizes. The lobes uh, sometimes show Z or S shaped structures within them. So you can see substructure uh, within the lobes. And this is believed to happen because of a precession in the direction of the jets. So uh, there are changes happening in the AGN itself. And uh, the jets may become more powerful or they may change directions uh, slightly depending on what happens in the AGN that powers them. And uh, that can lead to uh, different parts of the lobes uh, becoming brighter at different points in time. Lobes are usually two-sided and they're comparable in distance and luminosity uh, to each other. There is usually within a factor of two or so. However, one must remember that in quasars, one-sided lobes are often seen. Now, why this happens, uh, I will defer to later. Uh, this is, uh, many of these things uh, I am now uh, sort of putting into the bucket, which I call the uh, unified uh, model for AGN. And indeed, this is this is one-sided jets in AGN is one of the things that get explained by the unified model. Within a couple of lectures, we will reach the unified model, and many of these sort of empirical observations uh, will be get uh, explained in that context. Jets. So jets occur on parsec scales as well as on kiloparsec scales. And in quasars and more luminous radio galaxies, just like the lobes uh, are only one-sided, jets can also be uh, one-sided. Uh, uh, usually in radio, uh, the radio lobes, uh, even in lo more luminous radio galaxies, are two-sided, not one-sided. But the lobes, uh, sorry, the jets, can be and often are uh, one side. In less luminous galaxies, uh, by here we refer, we're referring only to the radio luminosity of the galaxies. Uh, in less lu radio luminous galaxies, the jets are very often or usually are two side. Then we come to the fourth component, which is hotspots. So hotspots are not always present, uh, but on certain occasions you can see multiple hotspots. So within the lobe, so what is the hotspot? Hotspot is a region of high uh, intensity emission uh, from which is located within uh, one of the radio lobes. Sometimes hotspots are not seen, but sometimes two or even three hotspots may be seen. If you look at their spectral index, it is intermediate it is certainly not as flat as the core 
but it is certainly not as steep as the lobes either. So it is somewhat intermediate. Okay. So now we come to a very, very important and fundamental classification uh, of radio galaxies, uh, which are referred to as the Fanerov and Rayleigh classes. There are two types, FR1s and FR2s. Uh, these were first uh, spoken about, written about in a seminal paper by Fanerov and Riley uh, in 1974. Uh, Fanerov uh, is a South African astronomer and uh, over the last many years, uh, he has done uh, a lot of work in developing uh, radio astronomy in, in, in South Africa. Uh, he's one of the uh, drivers, the key drivers behind the Square Kilometer Array project and uh, for bringing it uh, part of the telescope to South Africa. Anyway, so Fanerov, what Fanerov and Riley found is that when they looked at the extended radio morphology of galaxies, they found two kinds of galaxies. And what is shown here in the left panel, these are a Fanerov Riley 1 object. This is a Fanerov Riley 1 object. And this is a Fanerov Riley class 2 object. Right? Now, <clears throat> What differences uh, do you see between these two? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. In the first image, the jets are uh, bent in the S shape, while in the second image, the jet is uh, more like straight. And also in the first image, jets are much more thicker. And if if they if these are uh, same scale of images, jets are much more thicker. And in the second image, jets are much more narrower. And also the uh, uh, so, I think the jets are more powerful uh, in uh, uh, FR1 on the left side or on the right side? Uh, I think on the right on the right side, jets are more powerful. Jets are more powerful, yes. Then? And also the lobes in the first picture are much more, uh, are much are like much more spread out and uh, do not have a definite shape. But in the second, uh, they are uh, they are much more spherical uh, in shape, uh, maybe because of the uh, jets are more powerful, maybe because of that. Yes. Uh, can you say something about the size? I mean, I'm not even sure whether this is uh, to scale, but uh, if you have more powerful jets uh, that should produce more larger lobes and so on. So what can you say about the size? Which of these galaxies may be larger in size? Uh, about the size. Hmm. So, so if, if a more powerful jet is going on and uh, the shock will be also more powerful hmm. if, it, if it hits the gas. So it, it can be stopped in a very uh, much narrower path or it depends on the density of gas, gas encounters. Yes. I don't know. Exactly. Yes. yes, correct. So that's very good. So that would indicate that, uh, but it is true that uh, in terms of size, the uh, FR2 galaxies, which are the ones located here on the right hand side, they are generally more powerful uh, than, uh, than the FR1s. And they are therefore also, they can extend out to larger sizes, right? What can you say about the hotspots? About the presence of hotspots in the FR1s and the FR2s? Um, if uh... If the uh, more bright color means much more powerful hotspots, then the hotspots in the right side image are much more, I mean, at more higher temperature as compared to the image on the left. Correct. Correct. So there, that is also correct. So the hotspots are generally commonly seen in the FR2 galaxies. They are not commonly seen in the FR1 galaxies. Now, so let us look at now, uh, so we've sort of enumerated many of the differences that they saw. 
uh, but uh, we we cannot see with the naked eye the one important difference which they used in their paper to actually separate they they said let us not separate it by morphology yes morphology is clear but sometimes it is not obvious which is fr1 and fr2 the illustrations that i've shown here are like real solid there's a pakka fr1 and a pakka fr2 but often you will see galaxies uh, which uh, don't have this kind of very clear obvious fr1 fr2 characteristic there are galaxies which are referred to as like sort of fr1.5 okay which are sort of intermediate uh, between the two so they show some properties of fr2 some properties of fr1 but what they did was they used the radio luminosity uh, to distinguish and that's why i've highlighted here in bold so let us just review what uh, we saw as the properties of the fr1 galaxies they have weaker lobes uh, they have less well collimated jets so the jets although quite strong in the inner regions uh, sort of just diffuse out and disappear uh, by the time you come to the outer regions so they are they definitely these are the jets they are quite strong but very soon they sort of just uh, lose out whereas here the jets are very well collimated all the way up to the uh, up to the hot spots uh if you look at the optical counterparts of fr1 galaxies uh, they are uh, often uh, associated usually associated with cd galaxies i have already told you that cd galaxies are very very massive luminous galaxies elliptical galaxies that sit at the centers of clusters at the center of their potential well. fr1 galaxies often show bent tail structures right and higher optical uh, luminosity so uh, of the uh, i mean of the optical counterpart of course the lobes themselves uh, and the jets etc uh, usually don't have any optical counterpart so if you look at the region of the radio lobe in the optical you will see nothing there uh two sided jets are usually seen in uh, fr1 galaxies uh they show steep spectra at the outer edge of lobes uh, outer edge of lobes that should be sorry uh there are usually no hot spots so what does how does a spectrum uh indicate at least roughly the age of the plasma can you think of if i give you the spectrum of a particular slice of the plasma can you do you think you will be able to determine its age and how do we define age suppose the age will be suppose a plasma is being accelerated then it is not aging right but i am accelerating electrons and then at some point i say i no longer pump more energy into the plasma and i stop pumping energy into the plasma that is my sort of t equal to t0 that is my zero age after that i start looking at the plasma and counting its age so what do you think will happen so we we pump energy into some plasma and then we stop pumping energy and then we just watched its uh, radio spectrum uh, how it evolves with time so what will happen to uh, so when we pump energy into the uh, plasma remember we are not accelerating all electrons to the same energies we are accelerating uh, different electrons to a uh, different energies and we can assume to, to a first approximation that the energy distribution of the electrons is a power law so we are accelerating the uh, fewer electrons to higher energies and we are accelerating more electrons uh, to lower energies so now how do you think that that spectrum will will evolve how will the slope of that power law spectrum change with time okay let me uh, hello sir yeah go ahead 
with time i guess uh, energy will be much more equally distributed among the electrons yes so and, which we and, all, and also the number of ionized species will uh, will decrease if uh, if there is recombination much more recombination happening correct correct let us let us be very simple let us just say there are only electrons there for the moment which are emitting synchrotron okay there could be other ionic species yes uh, but for the simplicity let us say there are only electrons right in that case what will happen uh, tell me one thing uh, let me phrase it specifically do you think the uh, the high energy electrons will lose energy faster than the low energy electrons what do you uh, see remember this energy loss can be thought of in terms of cooling okay so therefore it is even referred to as synchrotron cooling so when we say that electrons uh, lose energy by emitting synchrotron radiation we refer to that process as synchrotron cooling so if you just forget electrons and all if you ha i had a beaker with hot water and a beaker with uh, more a beaker with very hot water another beaker with uh, moderately hot water which one of them will uh, cool faster uh, beaker with uh, hot water correct very hot water correct so the same thing happens here is that the this, the higher energy uh, synchrotron electrons or the higher energy electrons uh, emit energy faster or mo emit more energy than the Uh, electrons which are at lower energy right and this is this is this is a natural outcome of the characteristic frequency of emission uh, which we saw last time which is proportional to gamma square b right so the higher gamma electrons are going to emit at a higher characteristic frequency so in terms of total energy since the higher frequency photons have will carry away more energy they will lose energy faster so the high gamma electrons uh, lose energy faster than the lower gamma electrons and therefore what will happen to the spectrum it becomes steeper or flatter 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 remember the, the spectral index is negative slope so uh, the synchrotron spectrum has a negative slope so you are you are removing energy from the higher energy side uh, more energy from the higher energy side compared to the lower energy side so what will happen to the spectrum steeper steeper it will become steeper because anyway you have uh, lower number of uh, en lower energy coming from the high energy electrons so they're fewer in number right and therefore it will become steeper and they're also losing energy so there are you have these high energy electrons which are to start with fewer in number uh, and they are losing energy uh, faster than the low energy electrons and therefore the the spectrum will become steeper so therefore we can use the steepness of the spectrum as a proxy for the age right so when when suppose i just stop the injection of uh, uh, energy into the electrons i stop accelerating them they will have a certain slope as time goes on the slope will become steeper and steeper so older plasma will have a steeper spectral index than younger plasma so by using the spectral index we can get a proxy we can use that as a proxy for the age of the plasma okay so now coming back to fr2 galaxies uh, they have very strong emission from lobes and hot spots are often uh, seen uh, they have well collimated jets and as we shall see in a few minutes these jets can extend to very very large distances they have a higher radio luminosity they are hosted by 
massive ellipticals but their hosts are somewhat optically less luminous than the fr1 hosts and they are usually not cd galaxies they are elliptical galaxies but these are elliptical galaxies in groups or elliptical galaxies in less dense environments than what you see for the fr1 hosts <coughs> uh, jets are often one sided not always but often one sided and if you look at uh, modern surveys uh, or current generation surveys the number of fr2s detected in them uh, outnumber the number of fr1s by a fairly large factor somewhere between probably 20 to 30 uh, times more fr2s are detected in radio surveys than fr1s but this may be just a manifestation of the mamkus bias and the evolution of the uh, the radio luminosity of radio galaxies with redshift so if there are more uh, luminous of course because of the mamkus bias you will see only luminous galaxies at uh, radio luminous galaxies at high redshift so you will detect more fr2s than fr1s and secondly if there is a evolution in their properties with redshift perhaps they are brighter the galaxies in general are brighter so even more fr2s may get detected at high redshifts okay so sir, very often when you see images sir, in radio yeah so when we are talking about low and high radio luminosity are we talking about the core no 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 we are talking sorry i should have mentioned we are talking about the radio galaxy as a whole okay. uh, what is the total radio and level luminosity by adding the uh, adding the luminosity of the core the jets the lobes and hot spots everything taken together so yeah. by that by that uh, measure the fr2s have very high luminosity i should probably mention here that there are various dividing lines between fr1s and fr2s in terms of uh, luminosity but a typical 1.4 gigahertz luminosity of about uh, uh, 10 raised to 25 uh, watts per meter or watts per hertz uh, is considered as uh, the dividing line between uh, between the uh, fr1s and fr2s anything brighter than that is very likely an fr2 and uh, something uh, uh, less luminous than that is a fr1 um hello sir yeah go ahead sir, in the image of uh, fr1 and fr2 you have shown hmm yeah, so in the image of FR1, the background is much more black as compared to the in the image of FR2. Yes. So is it because of a high or low luminosities or is it some noise? On the no, image? I think it is just a function of noise and the specific stretch that was used to uh, show these two images. Okay. Right? Yeah, th there is no significance to the blacker background. Okay. So very often in uh, uh, radio images, radio images are also referred to as radio maps in the literature. Uh, often people, uh, in order to sort of highlight the, the subtle features, uh, people tend to use contour maps rather than uh, the images directly, but it's of course a representation of the same thing. Okay. Now here is a contour map of a galaxy. Uh, is it a FR1 or FR2? fr1 fr1 see you can see the jets near the center but they quickly diffuse out and the lobes are are much more diffuse than they would be in a fr2 okay here's another galaxy fr1 or fr2 fr2 ah, this one is a fr2 that's that's absolutely correct right because this has uh, uh, very, very powerful radio lobes. Uh, it has emission from the core, but it seems to have a one-sided jet. Now, remember while drawing contours, you have to be a little bit careful because depending on which contours are drawn and which are not drawn, uh, you may, may look like a one-sided jet or a two-sided jet. So if, for example, there may be a, a much weaker jet from here to the, uh, to the other radio lobe, but perhaps uh, that contour, that lowest contour was not plotted. Therefore, you can't see the jet. 
right? So uh, you have to be a little cautious in saying whether the jet is one-sided or not, because with a more sensitive uh, observation, uh, you may be able to detect the jet on the other side. You can also see the contours corresponding to a hotspot over here and to a hotspot on this side as well. So there are hotspots on both sides, but uh, the jet seems to be one-sided. Again, one-sided jets are quite common in FR2 galaxies. Okay. So this is a spectral index map of uh, uh, FR1 galaxy, uh, which was observed uh, uh, with the GMRT and with the VLA. So the GMRT observations were made at 240 megahertz and uh, uh, the VLA observations were made at 1.55 gigahertz. And this figure is taken from a paper by uh, Kolo Kaithas uh, et al. 2015. Uh, this guy, Constantine, uh, was a postdoc at Ayuka uh, some years ago, working with uh, Shoma Krai Chaudhary. Uh, anyway, so, so here is uh, Constantine's map uh, of the spectral index. So how do you create a, a spectral index map? What you do is you take the image of in one uh, frequency, you take the image in the other frequency and find the corresponding pixels and find their ratio, okay, and uh, uh, get compute the spectral index, right? You take the log of the flux in, in one frequency to the other. So you can get a resolved spec spectral index map. Before you generate a spectral index map, you must take care of one thing. What is that? Can I just take my 1.55 gigahertz image and 240 megahertz image uh, and just uh, take the ratios and take the log, etc.? This is again a techniques question. It's not a physics uh, of the galaxy question. This is of course related to the fact that the synthesized beam of the two observations may not be the same because there are different lambdas and the baselines, uh, longest baselines may also be different uh, with, between the VLA and the GMRT. And because of this, in general, the point spread function or the synthesized beam of the two interferometric observations uh, may not be the same. So you need to do a convolution uh, of the, the sort of sharper PSF. You need to convolve it to the, to the larger uh, beam size. And then once the beams are matched, then you can take a, 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 a the ratio between the two images. Okay, but so what do we see? Uh, uh, what are the sort of broad things you notice? Uh, look at the color index here. Uh, zero indicates a completely flat spectrum and 0 0.8, 0 0.9 indicates a fairly steep spectrum. So what can you say about the spectrum of the core? Yeah, it's flat. flat. Yeah, it's, it's flat. It's very flat, close to zero, right? And what can you say in general about the spectrum of the lobes? It's sort of greenish in color. So it's sort of 0.5 intermediate. It's not very, very, uh, uh, very, very steep. Okay. Around the edges uh, of the lobes, you see some red, right? Not at the central region, but along the edges, you can see red. And what does that indicate? Steep spectrum. Uh, steep spectrum. And what can you say about the plasma over More here? Edge. Huh? It's the old plasma, which it means it's not been accelerated for a long time. Right. Okay. So we will we'll come back to these ideas again. There's one more spectral index map. Uh, and here we can uh, clearly see that 
there seems to be a gradient in the spectral index. So actually the core is over here. Uh, we will encounter this galaxy again uh, later on in this talk. Uh, but the, it turns out that the core emission is undetectable. You can see the lobes uh, quite clearly, but you can't see the core, nor can you see the jets. They're only lobes, right? Uh, would this be FR1 or FR2? FR2. FR2. This is an FR2 object. Very, very powerful lobes, uh, but uh, weak emissions, no jets, etc. This is an FR2 object. And what can you see about, notice about the gradient of the spectral index? Uh, where is it steeper and where is it uh, shallower? Uh, is it, it is steeper uh, close to the core and shallower at the, at, uh, okay. away from the core, very away. Correct. Correct. Right. So normally, do you expect to see that? Do you expect to see uh, uh, this kind of phenomenon where you have steeper spectral index near the core. It is unusual in the sense that it should be accelerated by the jets. Correct. Uh, right. And is, even if the jets switch off, right, at some point, uh, they will, uh, they will stop accelerating the plasma which is farthest, right? So it is the plasma which is farthest which should uh, uh, start uh, aging first. And therefore, the older plasma should show a, a, a spectral index. So we should have seen a steeper spectral index in the farthest region from the core, not in the nearest region. And we are. this is usually seen in most radio galaxies. This particular galaxy is an unusual uh, radio galaxy in that sense, because it shows this kind of inverted gradient from what you expect of the spectral index. Now, how could this happen? Hello? Yeah. Uh, so maybe the jets were too strong and that's why the shocks happened much, I mean, shocks happened on the outer sides and the gas, it, uh, it formed a shell around the shocks and came back and yes, the, that, the that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So these red jets were, when they were there, were very, very powerful. They were just uh, powering themselves uh, through the plasma until they, uh, through the intergalactic medium, till they reached an over density. And when they were pumping energy into that, so very likely there were <clears throat> sort of hotspots which had formed here when the jets were active, right? And there is some amount of backflow. Backflow meaning the, the jets are pumping matter uh, into, into the intergalactic medium. They are impinging upon uh, over density in the intergalactic medium. And then the plasma is flowing backwards. So this is referred to as a backflow. Uh, this indicates that there is some amount of mixing uh, between the plasma in the lobes. It is not as if uh, the plasma, which is at this, this region of the lobe will never move there, or the plasma, which is here will never move here. This is strong evidence of, of backflow and has been seen not just in this particular galaxy and several other galaxies, typically in powerful FR2 galaxies. Good. Okay, so, so yeah, go ahead. Sir, what are these contours? The contours are contours of intensity. So what you do is you observe the, the uh, galaxy at some frequency. So this particular observation, uh, I think the contours are at 325 megahertz. Uh, that is the P band of the GMRT. And the contours indicate intensity. So this may be some certain Millijansky per beam, the innermost counter contour. The next contour will be slightly lower uh, intensity and so on. So it just indicates brightness. So the brightest part of this lobe is, is over here. 
and then there is a slightly less bright part outside and so on that's all it doesn't indicate uh, anything else it's just a way of visualizing the contour because i want i had to use contours to make this plot because the uh, the i wanted to use color for uh, determine for showing the displaying the spectral index okay so before i go on one announcement there will be no lecture on wednesday 19th may uh, because i have many other meetings that day uh, i will be unable to take the lecture so the next lecture will be the regular lecture that is scheduled for friday the uh, 21st of may at our usual time so i'll send out a email also in case there's someone who's missed today's lecture uh, so that they don't come on wednesday right okay so now we have looked at a sort of very very simplified uh, version of uh, uh, the radio galaxy some kind of sanitized uh, pictureization of that but if you look at uh, at radio galaxies uh, in in large surveys uh, you see uh, all kinds of shapes sizes Uh, and so on which are shown here so there are many there's one galaxy here one here one here one here one here okay uh, one here one here this is probably the same object right this is the same object we'll look at these kind of objects also then one here this is a pseudo color map now what we have done here is that uh, instead of using uh, intensity we have used color instead of using contours to represent the intensity we are using different colors to de represent different intensity levels so in these maps red is used to uh, represent the highest intensity green is somewhat lower and blue is uh, somewhat lower and so on so as you can see there is quite a lot of of diversity uh, in the radio morphologies of galaxies so this is to be remembered we are, we are, we don't have the time in this course to uh, study each kind of variation in detail but this is just a fact to keep in mind okay so but we will look at some sort of common variants uh, of of galaxies okay so here you see a core over here and there are two lobes okay but normally we expect the lobes to be sort of aligned in a in at sort of 180 degrees uh, apart from each other but here there seems to be some amount of bending of the of the lobe structures they're not 180 degrees apart they're more like 90 degrees or 100 degrees apart these uh, kind of sources are called the tailed sources and this is a specific kind of tailed source which is called the wide angle tailed source now by looking at the morphology could you say whether this is fr1 or fr2 again here red represents highest intensity and blue represents lowest intensity with yellow and green intermediate fr2 why do you think it's fr2 so like there are loops and we can see the hot spot and the the jets are straight that we see yeah the... so actually it turns out that the jets are only these this much okay these are lobes the lobes are extended they are not spherical clearly they're sort of more linear in structure but the jets are only these in that case do you want to change your opinion like at one side this jets is broad like on the right hand side but on the left hand side it is steeper like you can see yeah, but yeah. but all these things are straight not as if one side it is broad and one side it is steep it is steeper so i think yes that is true so you may say that this is sort of one sided but actually maybe not on your screen but on my screen i can see the second jet also okay, yes so this is actually an fr1 object because the hot spots are not located far away the hot spots are located very close and the diffuse emission which is 
it's certainly diffuse. It's not in a straight line, it's curved. But the weaker diffuse emission is spread out in the outer parts. There is no hotspot in the outer parts. And the jets, jets are where the hotspots are where the jets are supposed to end, right? That is where the, <coughs> the plasma stream uh, uh, from the jets is impinging onto the intergalactic media. And that distance here is quite small. So the hotspot here is over here. And maybe there is another hotspot over here or perhaps here. And uh, that is why it's uh, this one is a FR2 galaxy, FR1 galaxy. Now, we said something about FR1 galaxies being found uh, in the cores of, of clusters, right? Uh, do you know of any way in which uh, uh, in the core of clusters, there are special physical conditions that will cause uh, these lobes to get bent like this? What, what is there in the ambient region of the cluster between the galaxies in the intra-cluster medium? Dark matter. Sorry? It's a dark matter. Dark matter is there, but what about the, what baryonic component is there? I don't know. Uh, probably you haven't studied clusters uh, as a separate subject. Who uh, who taught the galaxy scores for you guys? Uh, Kanak Sa, sir. Kanak Sa, okay. So he may have focused more on, on dynamics and UV emission, star formation and so on. Okay. So within clusters, you have a lot of hot gas. Okay. It's, it is so hot that it thermally emits in X-rays. So many, many clusters... Uh, if you observe that part of the sky with the X-ray telescope, you'll see a diffuse blob of emission coming from there. And that is coming from the uh, thermal emission from the hot gas in the cluster. So when a galaxy moves, okay, every the, remember galaxies in the cluster are not stationary. They, are, they have to move around because they're feeling the, the potential uh, of the cluster as a whole. So they have a tendency to fall towards uh, the center of the cluster. And when they fall towards uh, the center of their cluster, their gas or their plasma, whatever they're carrying with them, encounters uh, an effect known as ram pressure. And because they're falling relative to, uh, to the hot gas in the intracluster medium, their plasma gets pushed backwards. So imagine a situation where this is a galaxy which is falling towards the cluster in this side, on this side, with the cluster center on this side, and it's getting bent. The plasma lobes that it has are getting bent. So this is what is happening in these wide angle tail sources. This is a very, very extreme example of a bent tail source. Okay, And this is referred to as a narrow angle uh, tailed source. And here, what is happening is, this is probably falling in, in this direction towards the uh, cluster center. This is the center, this is the galaxy from which these uh, lobes are coming out. The lobes come out, but they feel so much ram pressure because they're moving fairly rapidly through the intracluster medium that the jets get bent backwards, okay? and they leave these kind of wake like uh, structures okay these are also fr this is also an fr1 galaxy but except for the difference being that this is now a narrow angle tail there are two tails but there is a very narrow angle between the two and the bending of the jets is caused by ram pressure in the cluster medium so clearly these kind of bent galaxies uh, bent tail galaxies uh, are a clear indication that uh, these galaxies present in a rich cluster environment. And uh, we can, uh, so in fact, this may be a very easy way of identifying clusters, right? Because these objects can be detected at 
relatively high red shifts with uh, modern surveys. So besides the other techniques uh, uh, for finding clusters like the Sunyaev Zeldovich effect or just optical over densities and so on, this provides a radio based technique for finding uh, clusters at uh, moderate red shifts. Okay. So, so these some FR2 galaxies can become very, very large. Okay. And this may be because they are sitting in a particularly less dense part of the intergalactic medium. So that uh, when the jets come out of the galaxy, there is very little to stop them. Right. They are, uh, uh, they just continue streaming out uh, in both directions until, of course, they reach somewhere eventually a barrier uh, over density in the intergalactic medium, and then they form these kind of lobes. But in such cases, the distances can be very, very large. So I had earlier showed you uh, as a classic example of a radio galaxy, the Cygnus A galaxy, which is shown here for scale. And here the separation between lobes is 0.12 megaparsec. But we have now discovered uh, in this paper by Machalski et al. 2008, uh, we've discovered radio lobes separated by as much as five megaparsecs. So for context, the diameter of the Milky Way is 30 kiloparsecs, right? So it is uh, uh, 30 megaparsec would be a thousand times and uh, this would be one sixth of, the, uh, of that. So it is 160 times the diameter of the Milky Way. These are the largest sort of single object uh, driven coherent structures in the universe, right? Uh, all of these, these, both these lobes, which are five megaparsecs apart are drawing their energy from the AGN, which is sitting at the center of the black hole at the center, right? There are several examples, other examples that are shown. Uh, there is this object called 3C236, uh, which is almost as big as J1420 minus 045, but it's a very large uh, uh, galaxy. Uh, this is four and a half megaparsec, Hercules A. Uh, is a galaxy which is 0.6 uh, megaparsecs uh, in size, right? And this, of course, is Cygnus A, uh, which is relatively close by and uh, quite modest in size uh, compared to this, which is nearly 50 times large. Okay. So uh, recently, Pratik Dabhade at Ayuka uh, has compiled a, a catalog of uh, new giant uh, of giant radio galaxies, which includes uh, giant radio galaxies discovered previously, but he has also added several new discoveries. So Pratik was a PhD or maybe still is a PhD student at, at Ayuka. Machalski was uh, a, a Polish astronomer, is a Polish astronomer who discovered this five megaparsec uh, scale radio galaxy. And many years ago, Ishwar Chandra and Saitya at NCRA uh, compiled a catalog of uh, giant radio galaxies, uh, which is also very widely uh, cited in the literature. Uh, why are these giant radio galaxies important? Because uh, prima facie, they put a, a minimum age on the, on the AGN, right? The fact that we are seeing these lobes uh, still shining brightly uh, indicates that uh, the lifetime of the AGN is at a minimum uh, five megaparsecs, or let's say two and a half megaparsecs. But this assumes that the jets are moving at the speed of light. Uh, we have no direct measurements of the speed of the jets uh, far away from the nucleus, uh, but with VLBI, uh, we are able to actually measure the movement of blobs in the jets, but only on very, very small scales. And the measurements there indicate that uh, the plasma in jets, at least in the innermost parts, 
is moving at about 0.2 uh, C, right? But it is very unlikely that it will continue to move at those high speeds, even uh, when it is far away, it will uh, slow down, jets uh, will slow down. So even if you take that as the maximum, then the minimum age for this five megaparsec object would work out to be five times that, uh, five, uh, uh, five megaparsec is about 15 uh, million light years. Uh, you multiply that by five, it'll be at least 75 million light years. And from this, you get a really strong measurement of the lifetime of the AGN, right? And for big AGN, massive AGN like, like these, 10 raised to uh, eight years. So the 75 million years, if you approximate to 100 million years, uh, then 10 raised to eight years seems to be the typical lifetime of an AGN. If it is shorter, it is very much shorter. If you have only an AGN that lives for a million years, it can never produce lobes of this size. So at least some AGN are fairly long lived. And this informs the models of, of uh, AGN, uh, which try to model the switch off and the restarting of AGN. They have to take into account that if an AGN is on, it probably stays on for 10 raised to eight years. Uh, then it switches off and then maybe uh, uh, 10 raised to nine years later, it turns on again, right? So if the age of the universe is 10 raised to 10 years, very roughly, we know that AGN seem to, uh, at the peak of the AGN epoch were about 10%. Uh, so the duty cycle would have been 10% uh, at that time. And uh, uh, so every 10 raised to nine years, maybe these kind of massive AGN would turn on, okay? And stay on for about 10 raised to uh, eight years and then go quiet for nine into 10 raised to eight years and restart. So this is the modern understanding based on the simple uh, measurement of these large galaxy sizes. Finding giant radio galaxies at very high redshifts uh, is a very interesting uh, thing because uh, very often you don't have uh, enough time to build the supermassive black hole that you need to power these very powerful AGNs. <clears throat> And so uh, did you how did you build the, the first supermassive black holes? Are you able to build them at redshift five or redshift six when the age of the universe is uh, very small? There isn't enough time. So all of these pose very, very interesting questions. OK, so I will now show you uh, a short uh, video. So if you look at uh, uh, Hercules A, uh, the, this is just to show you the size of how large radio galaxies can get. So that is at the center is the optical galaxy. Okay. And now they're going to uh, overplot the, the radio lobes. Uh, there you go. And then they have done a visualization just to highlight the fact that the jets are sort of one dimensional, but the lobes are not two dimensional. The, remember the lobes are three dimensional. So they've done uh, a video and you can see that the lobes also show uh, some amount of, of, of substructure uh, in, in those structures. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so let's go on a bit. Okay, so let, let us see now what happens in this uh, particular uh, radio galaxy which showed the backflow. It's a high Z uh, radio galaxy. And what is shown in the middle panel, uh, just focus on the middle panel is that uh, the contours indicate the, the radio emission at 325 megahertz again, and the, these intensities or this sort of 
red and white colored uh, uh, image indicates the X-ray emission. The soft X-ray emission, which seems to coincide with both of the lobes. So now the question is, why is there X-ray emission from the lobes? Uh, sir? Yeah. Sir, is it coming from the hotspot region? No, there are, uh, it's not coming from the hotspot region. It is coming from the lobe as a whole. Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, this is a, remember, this is a high red shift radio galaxy. Uh, I'll give you a hint that if this, this galaxy is at a red shift of 1.3, okay? If it were at a red shift of 0.1, you would not have seen the X-ray emission, which is curious because normally you would expect that if for nearby objects, you should be able to detect uh, detect emission easily for far away objects it will be more difficult but here i am giving you a hint that it's ultra okay you don't expect to uh, you will not see for this particular galaxy if it were at redshift of 0.1 you would not have seen x-ray emission Okay, so I'm not going to tell you the answer. I will tell you the answer next time if none of you gets it, but please think about this, okay? Uh, before the next class, there is a radio galaxy, which is at high redshift, redshift uh, 1.3. Uh, it shows uh, clear uh, radio lobes, and it also shows clear X-ray emission uh, from those radio lobes. The X-ray emission is, not coming from the hotspots uh, of the radio lobes. In fact, the hotspots are not seen. As you can, uh, I mean, there is some over density, but there is no clear uh, uh, hotspot seen in these uh, radio lobes. So the question to ask is why is there X ray emission? What is the physical mechanism which is uh, causing this X ray emission? And the hint is that the X ray emission is seen because this is a high redshift uh, radio galaxy. If this were a, a low redshift radio galaxy, we would not have seen the radio emission. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, is uh, there, uh, I mean, is there a star formation going on in these? Lobes? No, no. There are no stars. There is no, very little gas. Okay. Remember, these are, this is just the diffuse plasma that is coming out from the uh, from the center of the AGN. It may be mixed a little bit. It may have ionized uh, some of the intergalactic medium and so on. Uh, the radio emission is pure synchrotron from an optically thin plasma, right? So it's very diffuse, very low density. It is not uh, very dense. But it does contain, what does the plasma contain? We know that it contains a large number of relativistic electrons. So it's, it's not coming from star formation. Okay, so think about it. Next time we will start with this and uh, continue our discussion on, uh, on radio galaxies. Uh, Are there any questions uh, based uh, ex except this slide? Are there any questions on uh, any of the other things that I showed? Yeah, hello, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so if not affected by the environment like hot gas, so are these lobe structure always symmetrical with the core? Uh, all, uh, symmetrical with the host? Yeah, with the core. With the core, okay. 
so there are there are two effects first of all they are not perfectly symmetrical there is no reason to expect that if an over density is located at 1 megaparsec on one side it will be located at exactly 1 megaparsec on the other side okay it could be located at 1 and 1/2 megaparsec or 2 megaparsec on the other side right so they are uh, not absolutely symmetric the other thing you have to worry about is the orientation effect okay if this is a face on uh, radio galaxy you will see the two lobes uh, clearly but imagine you you are viewing it along the axis of the jet for example then the two lobes even if they exist will appear to you as uh, as one lobe because they remember they are both optically thin so you can see the other lobe through through one lobe but you can see the photons coming from the other lobe uh, after passing through uh, the nearer lobe so there is no reason to expect uh, absolute symmetry but because the the universe uh, is uh, uh, the overdense regions tend to uh, uh, be uh, separated by lens scales uh, that don't change over uh, over uh, the local part of the universe the, it's not drastically different you can never have a one lobe which is uh, let's say uh, 50 kiloparsecs away and another lobe which is 5 megaparsecs away and also uh... is the, the viewing angle is also the reason uh, that we have is in some galaxies only one jet yes yes there are beaming effects as as we shall see when we talk of the unified model uh, we talk of this you're right so some galaxies show only one jet some show only one lobe uh, some show two lobes okay anything else okay if not uh, we shall stop here and continue on friday remember there is no lecture on wednesday uh, our next uh, lecture will be on friday thank you